Hi everyone, my name is Jaleesa Doni and I am the Social Sciences Librarian, so I represent the class Social Science Departments. Today I'm going to be talking about tips and tricks for Microsoft Word, Excel, and OneDrive. What we're covering today, like I just said, uh, we're going to focus on OneDrive, but we're going to focus on some very specific aspects of it. We're going to talk about the purpose of OneDrive, as well as its storage capacity and how to create and manage files and folders and share that information. Within Microsoft Word and Excel, what I'm going to touch on are some of the advanced features and some time saving tips. So this isn't an introductory workshop to Microsoft Word and Excel. This is focusing on some of those things that you might not know about within both of those programs. If you have any questions during the session, please type them in the Zoom chat box. Jessica will be moderating that and I also have it open so I can answer questions as they come up. So the purpose of OneDrive is to store documents, create documents, and share documents um, or items because it also includes the ability to create spreadsheets or PowerPoint files. If you are affiliated with the University of Idaho, you have access to OneDrive in its storage capacity. U of I provides you, if you're a U of I affiliate, with five terabytes of storage. This is a lot of storage, probably more than you would ever need. Google Drive only provides 15 gigabytes of storage, so very, very small. If you think about five terabytes, a single terabyte includes about 85,000 Word documents, 200,000 songs, or 310 pictures. So you have five times that amount. So you probably will not run out of storage space if you were using OneDrive. Just keep in mind that OneDrive is not intended to store any files or anything like that that might be classified as high risk by the university or by your department. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about whether you want to store your um, documents and those types of items in OneDrive. So let me show you how you can check your storage capacity in OneDrive because maybe you want to know um, how much you have. So these are the steps that I'm going to show you um, actively through my browser, but I just wanted to put them in the PowerPoint so you all can see what those are. So I'm going to go ahead and open um, the open my browser. To get to OneDrive, I'll close this. You can just open a new tab and you will just type in OneDrive.uidaho.edu if you're going to your U of I affiliated OneDrive. I've already logged in so that that doesn't take as much time. And once you are here on the OneDrive page, you can see any folders you have, any other documents you have or files. To check the storage capacity, what you will do is up here in the top right, there's a little settings icon. It's usually like a gear. So if you click the gear icon, you can then choose OneDrive settings. This might be hidden behind my, um, uh, my video recording depending on, or my video depending on the screen. But under that, you'll click OneDrive settings. From this page, you'll click more settings. And then you'll click on storage metrics. And so this will open a new tab. And up here at the top, we can see that I have, I'm only using 5,088.31 gigabytes um, or that many gigabytes is free of 5,120. And so there, there's a progress bar and there's not even like a tick in the progress bar. So I'm only using like 12 gigabytes of my 5,000 or so. So you will probably never run out of storage in OneDrive unless you're uploading um, like really high quality photos because you're doing research or really large data sets. It's probably not going to happen. So you can use OneDrive through, um, through the web. You can access all of your files that you create um, through the browser-based version, just the onedrive.uidaho.edu. But you can also, if you choose to, um, work within OneDrive to sync all of that information to your personal computer, whether it's a desktop or a laptop. So to do this, these instructions are for Windows 10. Jessica is gonna put in uh, the chat window a link that includes more information about syncing and setting up OneDrive. Um, and it includes information on how to do that for a Mac. But for Windows 10, you would click the start or the magnifying glass icon. You would type OneDrive and select the OneDrive app option. 
you would sign into your OneDrive account. You would use your U of I email and password if you're trying to sync with your U of I OneDrive. Then you would finish setting up your OneDrive app. Once you do that, you can locate your synced folders and files within File Explorer. So if I open up um, File Explorer, you can see I have a OneDrive University of Idaho option over here. And this entire list of folders and files mirrors exactly what's in the browser version of OneDrive. The benefit of storing your files in OneDrive, especially even if you're working from your own laptop or your personal computer, is that you can access this information, these files, these folders anywhere. So anywhere you have access to the internet, whatever computer you're working on, if you're doing homework or working on research at home on your personal laptop and then you come to campus, you can still access all of those files so long as they're in OneDrive. So this really makes it easy to make sure you can do your work wherever you are. And what's nice is any changes that I make to the files or the folders, if I create new things, create new documents here on my desktop, the same thing will happen in the browser version. And flip that. If I create a new file in my browser version of OneDrive or a new folder, it will appear and sync down here within the uh, desktop version of OneDrive. So sometimes, depending on what you're doing, you might not want syncing to happen automatically. So when you are um, syncing your files, maybe you want to pause it. And there's a few different ways. Um, I'm going to step through the options for doing that. Um, it's really, it's, it's a really simple process and you can pause it. Maybe you don't, maybe you have like low bandwidth or something, um, or your battery is going dead on your laptop and you don't want something dedicated to that. And um, so let me go ahead and I'll just show you what these instructions are. So I'm going to, again, this is the list of instructions, but I'm just going to show them to you live um, so that they're easier to see. Okay, so let me exit out of the PowerPoint. So what you do to pause OneDrive is once you're start, you've started syncing it, you should be able to see down here, um, kind of within my um, notification area, there's a little blue cloud and that's the OneDrive icon. So to pause the syncing, I will click that icon. It'll show you the recent documents you've had synced or you've worked on. You'll click help and settings. You'll click pause syncing and you'll select the amount of time. So you can say pause for two hours, eight hours, or 24 hours. So I'm going to say two hours. And we can see, it says OneDrive is paused, University of Idaho. You're not syncing any files. And down here in the icon, you can see there's like a little pause button on top of it. Now you can just wait until the amount of time ends or you know, expires and it'll start syncing again. But if you want to manually stop the pause, you can just click this icon again and then tap that pause button and it will re-sign in and reconnect you and it will start syncing right away. And depending on what you're doing, um, maybe you are, for some reason, no longer want to be synced with a specific OneDrive account. Maybe you leave the University of Idaho and you don't want to be confused as to where that's syncing. You can turn off OneDrive syncing by opening this little icon again, clicking Help and Settings, clicking Settings, navigating to the Account tab, which is where it kind of defaulted to. You could also add another account if you have a personal OneDrive account that you want to connect with. But if you wanted to stop the connection between your desktop and your um, online version of OneDrive, you would click unlink this PC and then click unlink account. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to reset that up. But that's how you could stop the syncing if you wanted to. So let me come back here. And so again, here's the instructions on how to manually resume syncing and then the instructions on how to turn off OneDrive syncing. Okay, so before we talk about Word and Excel, I just want to uh, make sure that everyone knows that access to your U of I accounts expire shortly after you leave the university. So if you are a student and you're graduating or if you're an employee and you're going to a different institution, you will need to migrate and save all of your information. So students can migrate to an at alumni.uidaho.edu email account, um, but OneDrive and anything you have in your U of I OneDrive 
does not um, get migrated, it does not transfer. So before you leave the university, you really need to back up any of your folders and files um, before leaving or even before migrating to a different account. If you don't do that, you will lose all of those files. So you can save all of the information on your OneDrive to a flash drive or to um, an external hard drive, or you could download it and upload it into Google Drive or a personal OneDrive account. Just make sure that you save any information and any files you have before you leave, um, because we wouldn't want you to lose any of that information. Okay. So now let's talk about Microsoft Word. So these are some of the things I'm just going to show you today really quick um, before we go on to Microsoft Excel. So what we're going to talk about is using section breaks to control headers and footers, how to dictate a document, how to translate a document, how to compare and combine documents that might have differences, how to restrict editing, and then how to use the file menu options. So let me open up this sample document um, that I'm going to use to talk about headings and section breaks. So oftentimes when we're in a document, we might want to put in headers or footers or page numbers, but depending on the document, we might want these to look different based on the page we're on. So the easiest way to add a header is you can double click up here in that header area and it will add it. You could also um, come over here to the insert tab and click header. Um, and then you know, select the option you want or just go to edit header and it will open that field. What I wanna point out to you is this options area. This is where you can make um, some decisions about how you want headers to appear throughout your document. So maybe you want a different first page for your header. Maybe you want this header to be, you know, entire title of dissertation. But then on page two, you just want it to be like the shortened title, maybe whatever comes before the colon or something, so shortened title. When you check that different first page, any changes you make to page one will not appear on page two. And page two, where we have the shortened title as the header, will appear on each of those other pages. So you can also add page numbers if you choose, you know, you can navigate to the footer, choose page number and choose where you want it to go. Since we put this on the first page, which is different, it won't appear on the second page until we choose it to appear there. And let's say we maybe wanted page three to look different than page two. We wanted page three to maybe have, um, instead of numeric page numbers, we wanted it to be letters for some reason. If you want that to happen, you need to create a different section between your pages. So we will come down to page two. And I'm going to go under um, layout and then under breaks, I'm going to choose a section break on the next page. So a new section will start on page three. So if I come down here to page three, since it's a different section, I can make changes to this one. So I'm going to double click up here to open the header or the footer. And we can see that this says same as previous. So same as previous section. If we want this new section to be different than page two, up here under navigation, under design, we can unhighlight the box for link to previous. So this will create a new section. And if I wanna change the page number, let's say, I can highlight it, right click, and go under format page numbers. Now let's say I want to, do A, B, C. I don't want to continue from the previous section and I want to start at A. So now this new section, I have the page number as A, B, continuing, but if I go up to page two, it's now numbers. So I know this is a bit kind of, you know, jumping around, but the way that you can create different headers and different footers besides just that first page being different is inserting those section breaks. That's one really easy way um, to change your document depending on what you're needing to do. So now let's talk about uh, dictating a document. So dictation in Microsoft Word um, allows you to use a microphone to record what you're saying and Microsoft Word will actually 
um, transcribe it within your document. The dictation feature is only available with Microsoft 365. So if you are affiliated with the U of I, you have access to that. If you have Microsoft Word, download it on your computer through the ITS office, or if you're using the web version of Microsoft Word. So let me show you um, just from <clears throat> the home tab. Over here on the right hand side, um, hopefully it's not behind my video, there's a little microphone that says dictate. So if I click this, it's going to ask if I haven't already set it up for permission to use my microphone. And once I click this, it'll start recording what I say. So you can see that the little recording red icon is there and it's actually recording what I say. And so you can use this if you want to transcribe what you're saying, maybe without typing. One thing to keep in mind is that you have to specifically say the punctuation you want. So if I wanted to end this sentence, I would need to say period. And it might maybe is getting some of your words wrong. So if you need to change anything, what you can do is click to stop the dictation. And then you can come back through and fix that. Now within um, the online version of Microsoft Word, which you can get through um, from OneDrive by clicking this um, little kind of square icon with the dots and going to Word. See, it'll take a second to open. The Microsoft or the online version of Microsoft Word offers even more features with Transcribe. So if we create a new document um, and Jessica pasted um, information on dictation, um, that link tells you everything you can say and the commands you can use to tell Word what to do. The great thing about dictate within the online version of Microsoft Word is that you can tell it to delete certain words, you can control formatting, you can add new lists, um, which is really cool. So the dictate feature is available here too. So whether you're working online or you're working from the desktop version of Microsoft Word, um, if you're someone maybe who um, thinks better when you're talking out loud, you can use this to kind of compile your thoughts. And I did look into the privacy of the dictation feature and according to Microsoft, uh, the service does not store your audio data or any of the transcribed text your speech will be sent to Microsoft and used only to provide you with the text results. So according to them, they are not storing this information. So another feature um, that I like in um, Microsoft 365, and this works in Word, it works in email, um, and other things like that, is that you can have the text on your page read aloud to you. Sometimes I do this when I'm sending an important email and I wanna make sure I didn't forget a word because I've been staring at it for so long. So to do this, what you would do is you would click where you want to start um, the read aloud. Um, and from the home page or from the home tab, let me come over here. Um, you would be able to navigate to that. Um, so under review, that's where we're going to go. We see this read aloud option. So I'm going to press it so you can hear what this sounds like. So if I pause that over here um, on the right side, once you start the read aloud, you can like change the voice if you want it to be um, a different, slightly different sounding voice. You can skip ahead, you can play, you can go back. This is just a feature maybe if you want to hear something read out loud, because I know that sometimes when I'm reading things in my head, I, it might just sound a little weird. So maybe I want to hear someone else's voice read it. So this is something that's just a unique feature in Microsoft Word. Um, that could be helpful for you. And you could do this too, you know, if you had a, a document that you were um, wanting to read, but maybe you didn't want to look at the screen, you could have it read out loud to you. So this could be a feature you could use too. So I'm going to minimize this. And what we're going to talk about now is another feature that I really like in Microsoft um, Word, which is the ability to translate um, sections or entire documents. So Microsoft Word has this feature. Um, and so I have this um, newspaper article that was published in La Nacion from Costa Rica, and it's about slots. So let's say I want to translate this um, so that I can read it, because maybe I know a few words in Spanish, um, but I don't know enough to be able to read this article. To translate specific sections of a document, you would go under review, 
you would highlight the text that you want to translate. You would click translate and then you would say translate selection. And so over on the right hand side of the page, that's where this is going to start doing that translation. And it auto detected that it was Spanish and I have it set to automatically translate to English. You can choose any other language you want this translated to and then you can read this document or read that little section of text you highlighted. You could then insert that translation into your document. Now, Microsoft also offers you the option to translate an entire document, but that seems to not work as well as translating section by section. So let's say, um, I just wanna show you too, um, to highlight this, is that Microsoft actually lets you open, I'm gonna go open, I'm gonna go browse. It lets you open PDFs in Microsoft Word, um, and this could facilitate translation. So if you're doing research and you come across a PDF, of an article related to your topic in Russian or in Chinese and you need to translate it, you can open a PDF directly in Microsoft Word. Some of the formatting may get a little weird, like the headers and stuff like that, um, but usually the text is um, opened just fine. So this is that same document on that same article. If I were to go back to review and say translate and translate the entire document, it's gonna try to do that and it says document translation failed. And so sometimes, even though you can see it allowed us to translate a section or a selection of text, the actual translation of the entire document as a, as a whole thing didn't work. So you can try translating the whole document to start, um, but then if that doesn't work, you could still always come down here um, and highlight and go under translate and translate selection. And then you could see um, hopefully once this loads, uh, the text that's associated with that section. So that is an option too if that doesn't work. Okay, so next in Microsoft Word, let's talk about comparing and combining documents. So sometimes when we're making changes to a document, maybe we're working on a document and we save it as draft and then we open it and we save a different version as final and then we're like, um, I feel like I've made changes and maybe I want to go back, but I don't want to just highlight and like read through this whole thing and figure out what the changes were. Microsoft gives you the ability to compare um, two documents for differences. So let's say I have, this is like my original document. This was my first draft. If I want to compare this document to a newer version, I would come under review. I would choose Let's see, where did I see this? Compare. And then these first three options are comparing because I'm syncing with OneDrive. So I'm gonna ignore those. I don't wanna compare those versions. I wanna compare a different saved document. So I'm gonna choose compare. Another option is combine, which we're gonna talk about. But the difference is that compare allows you to, allows Word to look at two files that have changes, but those changes haven't been made using tracked changes. Combine allows you to look at a document where tracked changes have been used. So I'm gonna choose compare, and I need to choose which document I wanna start with, the original. And so I'm gonna choose this original document and which one I wanna compare it to. So the document that has revisions. I'm gonna click that and navigate to it. I'm gonna do compare. And this is where you could say, these are the types of things that I want to be um, indicated or to be shown to me as changes. So you could say, maybe I don't care if um, formatting changes have happened. Maybe I only wanna care about text that has moved or changes to white space. You can show changes at the character level or at the word level. I'm gonna say word level because I don't really care if only one character was removed from a word. I wanna look at the whole word. And then I'm gonna say show these changes in a new document. So once I click OK, the screen is gonna look really confusing. This left-hand side is where you can see the revisions that have happened. So there are some formatting revisions in terms of font from one document to the other. There's some word changes. This middle document is the compared document. So that's the one that has the revisions. The right hand side top is the original document, that one I started with. So my first draft, 
Below that is the revised document. So the revised document would include the changes merged between um, my original my and my compared document. They would be merged into this revised document. So if you wanna save the revised document, you can come up here to compare and under show source document, you can choose which version you wanna see. But if you say show revised, it'll just show that one. And then you can, let's see, I'm gonna close the compared document and you could accept all of these changes and then save it as a new version. So this is helpful if you've made changes to a document, you don't remember what they were, you wanna make sure you haven't missed anything. Now another option, like I said, is that combine. And this is when track changes have been made. So under compare, if I choose combine, again, I will navigate to that same original document, let's say. And then under revised, I will choose one with track changes. So you can't, well, you could choose a, track, a document with track changes um, for the compare version, but it won't show up. It won't show those changes. So I'm gonna choose combine, and it's gonna show me that same thing. But it just does it in this single document because that's what I selected. And you can see track changes right here. I could go through and accept these. These seem really similar because I'm using the same documents to illustrate this or the same text, but think about Compare is maybe when you are the only one who's been working on a document and you've made changes over time. Combine is useful if you've made changes to a document and then maybe your colleague is working on a version of the document, you're co-writing a journal article, and you wanna see differences between your two original documents. That's where Combine could be really helpful. Okay, so I'm just going to accept all these changes, just so we have a working document. So now let's talk about restricting editing. So sometimes when we're working on a document, we don't want other people to make changes to it, but we do want them to read it and maybe share their feedback. So we can easily restrict editing from this review tab by clicking restrict editing under this protect um, area. So under restrict editing, we can choose formatting restrictions. So maybe don't um, you know, change the formatting in this way. But I like the editing restrictions. This is where you can say, don't add text, don't delete text. If you click or check the box for allow only this type of editing in the document, you can say only allow people to make track changes. They can't just type stuff in and not indicate that it's a change. They can only add comments. They can only fill in forms. There's no forms in this one, but you could do that. Or you can say no changes, read only. So if you say no changes, read only, other people that you share this document with can open it, but they can make no changes. They can only read the document. So depending on the type of feedback you're wanting, you might wanna choose track changes or comments. Once you select those options, you can make exceptions um, to specific people. When you're ready to start um, this restriction or this protection, you say, yes, start enforcing protection. You'll have to create a password. So make sure you remember the password because even you will have to, if you wanna turn off editing, enter that password in. So if I just do a simple password, just so I can show you this, I'm gonna say, okay. So I can't, because this is a read-only document, I'm hitting delete and can't do anything, even though I'm the creator. So if I wanted to stop those restrictions, I would come back under review, I would click restrict editing, and on the very bottom, I would say stop protection. And then I would have to enter that password. And then I would be able to edit the document. So restrict editing even stops you from making changes unless you enter the password. Another way that you can protect your document, maybe if you don't want to restrict editing, but you just want to restrict who can open the document, is to set a password to encrypt the document. So under File, if you go under Info, you'll have the option here to protect the document. If you click Restrict Editing or Restrict Access, that'll take you back to those features I just showed you. But you can also say Encrypt with a password. Now this password you could share with other people and it would allow them to open the document if they wanted to read it and then edit it. So this only restricts 
who can open the document. It does not restrict any editing um, capabilities. So some of you might not be working on documents that require you, know, to, you to set restrictions for editing or that require you to add passwords, but it can be helpful, especially if you're working with something maybe um, that includes, you're doing research and it includes information about participants or it includes um, information you're really just not ready to share or you want your advisor to read your thesis, but you don't want them to make changes unless they're tracked um, or make suggestions unless they're in comments. So this allows you to have more control over the documents you're creating when you share them with other people. Now, if you all are interested in the future in publishing your research with journals, a lot of times they are doing either, usually they're doing like double blind peer review. And so they don't wanna know who, they don't want the reviewers to know who the author is of a specific document, right? So they say, don't include your name within the document. Don't include your institution within the document. But there's other places that your personal data and information are stored within Microsoft documents, whether it's PowerPoint, Excel, or Word. So to make sure all of that personal information is removed to meet those criteria for peer-reviewed publications. Under this file menu, if we go back to info, there's this option that says inspect document and check for issues. Now this isn't where you think this information would be, but this is where it is. So if you click check for issues, you can say inspect document. Check for hidden properties or personal information. So if I click inspect document, it's gonna say, when you do this, it might remove things. Are you sure you wanna do this? Do you wanna save a separate copy? I'm gonna say no because I'm not concerned about that. This checkbox is going to show you everything it's looking for. So it's looking for comments and revisions, which is helpful because sometimes maybe there's a comment or a track change that's hidden in your document somewhere. And if you don't have that turned on, you might not see it. So this will point those out to you. And then you also have the box checked for document properties and personal information. So I'm going to say inspect. And right here it says, the following document information was found. Properties, document properties, content type information. If I click remove all, it is going to remove all of my personal information from this document. So let me show you how this looks different, different um, once this information is removed. So over here on the right side, you can see there is no author listed. And since I removed those properties once, they will not be re-added, even if I continue to edit this document. But if I were to open up um, this, you know, practice translation document and went under info, I'm listed over here as last modified. And so since I removed that information from that document, even if someone were to get into the properties of my Word document, they couldn't figure out that I was the author. So that is required for some journals before you submit an article. So just keep that in mind and go through those steps if you need to remove that information. Okay. So now, um, let me just point out one thing before we go into Microsoft Excel. When you're in this file menu, at the very bottom, there's an options button. The options button allows you to change how information appears in Word um, and some of the ways um, that you can work within Microsoft Word. So one of the options I like to point out is under proofing, is you can set your autocorrect options. So some autocorrect options in Microsoft Word are helpful, some are frustrating. Um, so you can choose which ones you want to turn on, you can choose for it to you know, check spelling as you type, um, you can choose for it to look for and mark grammar errors. There's other options over here. If we go under advanced, um, we can scroll down. I like to point out the cut, copy, and paste options because sometimes if you're copying something from you know, a Google Doc into Microsoft Word, it just doesn't look right and you have to choose the option you want. You can say, you know, keep the source formatting, merge the formatting, or keep text only. So, you know, these are options where you can actually get in there and tell Word how you want it to work. So let's jump into Microsoft Excel. And I'll just 
give you a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about freezing panes, sorting and filtering data, viewing and inserting functions, applying con conditional formatting and formatting data as a table, adding data value validation, inserting charts and creating pivot tables, and using some of those same file menu options. So here is an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, this spreadsheet includes data on faculty um, and staff at the University of Idaho who have received funding through our Open Access Publishing Fund. So this includes like the year they received funding, their name, college department rank, all of this information that I got from their applications. So since this is a pretty long spreadsheet, when I'm scrolling, I can't see the headers. And maybe I wanna make sure that the headers in that top row are visible. But if I scroll to the right, maybe I also want to make sure that the fiscal year or their name is visible regardless of how I scroll. You can do this by freezing your panes. And that just means that as you scroll either up or down or left to right, you'll be able to maintain your view of specific information. So to do that, we'll come up to view. And before we click freeze panes, we'll want to put our little cursor, our box, where we want the freezing to appear. So our options are to freeze the top row if we just wanna keep that top row while we scroll up and down, freeze the first column if we wanna keep it as we scroll side to side. But if we want to do even more, maybe we want um, the entire top row, but then we also want the first two columns to be frozen, we could then use freeze panes. So put your little box where you want the freezing to, um, to end. And so when I have it here, this top row will be frozen and these left two columns will as well. So if I click freeze panes, now I can see as I scroll down, it keeps that top. And if I scroll to the right, it keeps those left columns. So this can just be, make it easier to see your data depending on the size of your spreadsheet. Now all of this data, um, you know, is interesting, but maybe I wanna do a bit more with it. Maybe I wanna sort it not just by fiscal year, which is how it's sorted now. Maybe I wanna sort it by college. So to do that, I can come under data. And I have a few options. The most basic options are A to Z or Z to A, so it'll be alphabetical. So if I wanted to sort college alphabetically, I could highlight that um, column just by clicking on it and say A to Z. And it says, do you want to expand the selection? And yes, I do, because if I don't expand the selection, it'll just sort college, but it won't change any of the other data. So then the data won't be correct because Philip Bass, who is in agricultural and life sciences, will appear with the different college. So I'll say expand the selection and click sort. So now instead of it being listed by fiscal year, I have it organized based on college. If I wanna get more specific with my sort, I can choose this sort box. This allows you to create um, multiple criteria to sort at a time. So maybe what I wanna do is I wanna sort by college A to Z, but then I want to sort by applicant name A to Z. And so it's doing that sort and it changed it by alphabetical order by applicant name. Another way to sort or filter your data is to use the filter option within Excel. It's really easy, it's in this same little box. If you click filter, it'll automatically add filter capabilities to your header row. So I could say what I love about filters is that it allows you to not only look at all of your data in the spreadsheet, it allows you to say, okay, only show me data that meets the specific criteria. So maybe if I come over here to department, I can see all of the departments that I have data on, all of the applicants. Maybe I only wanna see people from physics. I would uncheck select all, and I would come down here and choose physics, and I would say okay. And there's only been one individual who has applied for and received the Open Access Publishing Fund from the physics department. So I could easily see that information really quick without having to scroll down or do control find. To get back to all of the data, I would click on where I had done the filtering and just re-choose select all and click OK. Now sometimes we might want to change our data a little bit using a function. One of my favorite functions is text 
um, or options or features in Microsoft Excel is text to columns. So when you're working with a spreadsheet, oftentimes you don't want your data to be separated by things like colons or commas or semicolons, especially if you want to do sorting. Because right now, you know, our applicant data is sorted or is merged last name, comma, first name. So if we wanted different columns for each of those, we could do that using this text to columns feature. So since I know that all of my data is separated as or is written as last name, comma, first name, I want to tell Microsoft Excel to split this single column into two columns whenever it sees that when it sees that comma. Before I do this, I need to insert a new column. So I'm going to click on C, then I'm going to right click and say insert. I know there's only one comma because this data is only last name, comma, first name. So I'm adding one new column. If you had last name, comma, first name, maybe comma, middle name for some reason, you would need to add two new columns because when you split your text, it will replace data if it comes across a call, if it doesn't come across an empty column. So I'm going to highlight B. I'm still under that data tab. I'm going to say text to columns. I'm going to choose delimited because I want to split it based on the appearance of a specific character. I'm going to say next. By default, it says tab. I'm going to uncheck that box. I'm going to say separate this data when you see a comma. If your data included something that wasn't a space, semicolon, or tab, like maybe it included a dash or an equal sign or a plus sign, you would just check the box for other and type that character in there and it would do that same process. But I'm going to say comma and you can see what this is going to look like. I will say next. I'm just going to keep the column format as general. It's not a date or anything like that. Then I will click finish. And doing that, it split that column really easily into last name, first name. And so this provides us with a few more options to maybe sort our data or um, to analyze our data by splitting that up. So let's talk about functions now. So I'm going to go under the formulas tab. So you can either type in formulas or functions manually, um, but Excel offers some auto options. So if I come down here to the bottom, maybe I want um, a count or a total of the amount of money that we have spent on the Open Access Publishing Fund so far in the last three years. I would click at the very bottom where I want that sum or that um, formula to appear. Under the formulas tab, I would click on auto sum and I would choose sum since I want to add everything together. It's going to make a guess about the data that I want to include and it's correct, so I hit enter. And that is the auto sum of that data. If I wanted a different automatic function, I could delete that and I could say, show me the average. So the average article processing charge to publish in an open access journal that we funded was $1,313.39. So AutoSum allows you to automatically create a formula or a function without knowing what you're using or without having to type it in manually and kind of highlight the area that you want to use. Now there's other functions that you can insert uh, depending on what you're interested in. Um, there's financial functions, logical functions, text, date, math and trigonometry. Um, within, uh, you know, Microsoft Excel, if you Google, you know, Microsoft Excel functions, you'll see a list of all of those if there's ones you're interested in. And it will really depend on what you're hoping to do with your data, the type of function you're going to use. Um, and if you ever have questions about those, you can reach out to me or again, just Google them and determine what those functions are. Um, under text, there's so many of these, um, but if you highlight over any of them, it tells you what they are. So that's really helpful. So one function that I like um, is for it to show you like the max or the minimum value because a lot of like what I'm working on with this spreadsheet um, are numbers and kind of currency. So if I wanted to see the minimum or the smallest amount of the APC that we paid, I would just do the equal sign, which starts any function or formula you're typing in by hand. I would say min, 
When you start typing, it'll give you suggestions. So min returns the smallest number in a set of values. I would do parentheses because that's what I do before I select the values I want to look at. I would highlight the area of the data. And then I would put a parenthesis at the end and hit enter. So the minimum is $250. Okay. So now let's talk about conditional formatting. So when we are looking at our data, sometimes we want um, information to appear um, and for certain things to happen um, automatically when data gets entered. And so right now we're doing some filtering, which allows us to maybe show specific departments um, or information like that. But maybe I want Excel um, to not just show me the list of this, you know, currency of this value. Maybe I want it to highlight when a, an article processing charge is above a certain amount. So to do that, I would come back to home. I would highlight where I want the conditional formatting to appear. I would click on conditional formatting and I would either go under highlight cell rules if I wanted to choose something, kind of one of their basic um, standard ones or go under new rule. If you go under new rule, you get even more options to choose like color gradients and all of that. Um, and I kind of like going under new rule because it gives you more control. So let's say I want to um, use a formula um, to format values that are above or below that average. So I want to format values that are equal or above the average for that data that's in that column. If I click format, this will allow me to choose how the formatting will appear. Do I want it to fill the box with a specific color? Do I want a specific border color? Let's say fill it with yellow. I will hit OK and then OK. So now this conditional formatting is automatically highlighting any value that is above average from this list of values. So if I type in, you know, I could continue adding more data and expanding that selection to make sure that um, that conditional formatting keeps happening. So $2,000 I got highlighted. If I type in 100, it won't. So conditional formatting just allows you at a quick glance to call out specific parts of your data without having to manually scroll through. Now another option um, that kind of expands this filter property is to format your data as a table. So this provides you with um, not only the filtering, but a presentation of your data that looks a bit nicer. So this is available under the Home tab. If you click Format as a table, you can choose what you want your table to look like. So maybe I want my table to be yellow. I will choose that. And it will kind of make a guess about where I want my table, what I want included in my table. Make sure you check the box to say your data has headers. Otherwise, it won't give you that nice header row. And when I click OK, it's formatted it by, you know, changing the color of the header row, changing the color of the alternating rows, and it still has that filter capability. So this is really helpful if you're trying to create a table. Um, from your data and you want to maybe share that with other people and to have it be kind of presentation or um, presentation worthy or visually appealing. Now if we wanted to remove this table formatting um, because maybe we didn't like the color anymore and we just want to go back to the raw data. To do that, click within your table, go under the design header and it's not going to seem intuitive, but you will say convert to range that will remove this formatting from the table. So if I click convert to a normal range, it will remove this filtering capability. And then if I wanted to get rid of the colors as well, I could just highlight the entire table, control A, go back to the home tab, go to the little icon where you can fill your cells, click this down arrow and say no fill. And I would need to change the text up here to black because I think it had been white previously. Yeah, well, I just filled it in. Um, but that's how you can remove the formatting um, of the table if you wanted to. Okay, so we are just cruising right along. So let's say we're interested in data validation. 
Within Excel, data validation allows you to set limits on the information that can be entered into specific cells. It can be numbers, it can give you a drop down and say, these are the options you can choose from. If you don't choose these options, I'm not gonna let you put any information in this cell. The easiest way to do that and the first step I recommend is to format your data as a table. This will allow you to continue to add new rows to your data and have that validation continue. If you don't format it as a table, you'll have to remove any of those settings and then reapply them each time you add more data. So let's say I want to um, set data validation so that um, all of the colleges are entered the same way. I wanna just give a drop down so that I can make sure when I'm selecting the college for that's a, a specific person is affiliated with, I'm not spelling it wrong, I'm not using an ampersand when I should use, and I'm not adding in extra spaces. To do that, I would select where I want the data validation to occur, so maybe column D. I would come under data, the data tab, and I would choose data validation. Then I would say data validation to get into this feature. Under settings is where you choose the type of validation you want to apply. So you can say only enter a whole number, only enter a decimal. If you want a drop down of options for text based entry, choose list. I like to choose the box for in cell drop down because that'll let you, it'll show a little arrow and then you can check the box that you want. For source, you have two options to enter information. You could type in the text that you want to appear. So this would be easier if we were saying like, yes, no, maybe, maybe it was like a survey and we wanted to track people's responses. You would type in each value and separate them with a comma with no spaces. But since this data is detailed and it's, a, it's an exact list, I don't wanna type it out. The easiest way to apply this validation is to include that list of items that you want um, to appear and just a separate part of your spreadsheet, so in a different sheet. So in this sheet one, I have all of the names of our colleges on campus. So you can see that I am still here in source and it's saying, okay, I'm looking at sheet one for this data. I would highlight these values and then I would say, okay. So now I can see as I scroll down, it applied validation. And we can see that there's little green arrows when there's something wrong. Something wrong, it's not matching the validation. There's an error. And that's because extension isn't listed as a college. These are the only options I can use. If you want those incorrect um, values to appear um, more obviously, uh, just go under data validation and say circle invalid data. And it'll give you a little indication of where those are. And since we set this up as a table, as I come down here and start adding like a new row of data, and I come to this college box, if I check that drop down, click that arrow, it'll give me an option to choose a specific college. This is helpful if you wanna make sure that the way you're entering data is consistent. Under data validation, if we highlight that same column and click data validation, I'm gonna clear those circles. If we go back into this, we can also add an input message so that if someone clicks on that cell, it'll tell them what you're expecting, what type of data you wanna see. You can also set your error alert. So the error alert would say, you know, if someone types in the wrong data or doesn't select something, it'll either stop and not let them proceed. It might give them a warning. It might share information. You can add a specific error message. So this is probably more useful if you're sharing your spreadsheet or more than one person is entering data. Um, probably less helpful or less important for you to select if it's just yourself that's working on it. So to remove data validation, um, you could just come under data validation, go under settings and click clear all, and then all of that validation information is closed or is removed. So instead of talking about inserting charts, I wanna talk about pivot tables for our last couple of minutes because I think that those are more fun than regular charts. So a pivot table 
allows you to summarize and analyze your data and helps you see patterns and trends. It allows you to get a bit more specific than you can with a regular chart or with filtering and sorting data. So to insert a pivot table, you can come to the uh, insert tab and just click the pivot table box. Again, it's going to take a guess about how big your table is. Um, you can change that range if you need to, um, but usually it's pretty good at determining the size of your table. You can choose where your pivot table is to be placed. I like to choose new worksheet um, because it'll open up a new sheet here for you to work on. If you say the existing worksheet, it'll kind of paste it on top of what you're doing. So I like to say new worksheet and then click OK. So it added a new worksheet here and it has pivot table. And you can see these fields. So the fields are your headings, the data that you have, and then you have different areas down here. So the filter would allow you to say, you know, only show me data from a specific fiscal year. Maybe you want a filter option. So we'll drag that down here. We can see there's a fiscal year filter up here. And then maybe I want to include in my column total funding and then my row. So going across, I want to look at total funding by department. So we can see that on the left hand side where the columns are or where the rows are, that's the list of all of my departments. But we can see that the total funding is blank, even though it's in the column. And that's because since I want those monetary values associated with total funding to appear, I have to grab total funding and drag it down to values. And it didn't change it right away either. And that's because hopefully you can see it. It says count of total funding. So it's not counting. I don't want it to count anything. I want it to do something different. So if I come under um, value field settings, Let's see if I choose sum and say, okay. Okay, I think it's because, yeah, I didn't do, I was gonna show you all how to enter in a sum equation, so equal sum, there we go. Okay, so now that there actually is data there, if we come back here, I should be able to come under analyze and refresh, and there we go. So it does the sum of total funding. So that looks really odd. That's not exactly what we're hoping for. So that's where we might be able to change how these columns and how this data appears. So let's see. So I'm gonna choose, let's say average. And so when you're working with a pivot table, oftentimes it takes you a couple of tries to make sure you get um, exactly what you want. So I'm gonna delete the value from here. And instead of having this as a column, I'm just gonna move it to a value. And that small little change you can see very quickly makes our pivot table work. So pivot tables take a lot of trial and error, but what's great about this is that we have this table that shows us how much funding we have allocated to each department. And this type of presentation would not have been available. We could not have gleaned this quickly by this spreadsheet. We could have done filtering and said, okay, so show me animal and vet and food science. Okay, I'm gonna add this up. This was the total funding. Now show me biological sciences. Okay, this was the total funding. When you do a pivot table, it allows you to do this very quickly. It pulls all that data together and allows you to make those comparisons. And we wouldn't have to stop with this pivot table. Maybe I don't just want department, Maybe I want college. So I'm gonna drag college down here and it breaks up the data by college first and then department under that and shows, you know, the total funding for ag and life sciences and then the funding for each department. Maybe I don't just want total funding. Maybe I want average funding. I could grab this total funding again, pull it down into values. It's defaulting to sum. I could go value field settings and say average. So we can see that Ag and Life Sciences has received $9,400. The average amount of funding that they have received for per request is $725. So this is data that we could not have seen um, at all if we had just looked at our basic spreadsheet. So this is a super quick introduction to pivot tables. Um, and if you need more help um, with specific data you're working with, 
um, please reach out to me. I'm happy to work with you via email or via Zoom. Um, and I can also um, point you to some other documentation or refer you to some um, other people here at the university um, if you need additional assistance. And remember we set this filter for fiscal year. The great thing about a filter is I could say it's showing all, so just show me 2020 data. And then it changes that spreadsheet or it changes that pivot table right away. So this is super helpful. I love pivot tables um, because it just lets you look at your data in a different way. Okay, so that is all I had today. It was a whirlwind um, presentation on OneDrive, Microsoft Word, and Microsoft Excel. I hope that you learned some new information um, about um, OneDrive and some of the features in Word and Excel uh, that you'll be able to use. Jessica just posted our post-session survey link. Please fill that out. It's just a few questions. I would love your feedback and it's completely anonymous. We have two more Graduate Student Essential Workshops coming up. Next week is Organizing Your Research and Data Management. This is a great workshop where we'll discuss file organization strategies, storage options, and tips to manage your workflows when analyzing data. So please sign up for that. That's going to be great. And then on October 20th, we have creating a research poster. Um, we're going to be talking about creating research posters for conferences or presentations um, that are happening kind of in the digital realm because of COVID-19 um, and the fact that a lot of conferences are no longer in person. So please sign up for those last two. Uh, following this session, we will post this workshop on this workshop recording on YouTube and everyone who has registered and attended will receive a link. So I'll go ahead and have Jessica uh, stop the recording.